All right, so we will get started. Uh, welcome to everybody who's tuning in, uh, either good night or good morning, regardless of where you are in the country. Uh, we have a what I think is going to be a fun webinar tonight. Um, I actually had a lot of fun writing and uh, researching this webinar, and uh, I hope that you find it just as interesting and fascinating as I did. Uh, for those who are tuning in for the first time, this is your first EBFA webinar. Special welcome for those who have tuned in before. Um, all of our webinars are recorded, they're archived, and they can be found on the EBFA YouTube channel, which is youtube.com backslash EBFA fitness. We have all of our past webinars. There are probably a good... 30 to 40 webinars, which are all purely educational, and uh, it allows you to kind of continue your exploration into foot and ankle integrated uh, movement, barefoot science uh, at home until you can hopefully attend one of our certifications. Uh, so what we're going to do is I'm going to go through the webinar, and then we will spend some time going over some uh, Q&A. So if you do have questions, there is a question box on the bottom part of the control panel, and I will go through um, those if anyone has any questions at the end. And I'll mention this again at the end. However, if you do want a copy of the PowerPoint, please do send me an email at education at ebfafitness.com, and I will be mentioning that again at the end. So we are ready to get started. Uh, we are going to be exploring how the foot has kind of evolved from this primitive foot into what we now know as the bipedal human foot. And it's actually quite fascinating that evolution in the shaping and a lot of the similarities that we have to the primates, such as chimpanzees, gorillas, apes, and how that has actually been um, carried through the evolution of the homo sapien. Uh, my name is Dr. Emily. I am the founder of the Evidence-Based Fitness Academy. I'm a podiatrist and the creator of the Barefoot Chain Specialist Certification. Um, and my, my passion is everything about from the ground up integrated movement and, of course, the foot. So why is an understanding of the evolution of the human foot important? Why, why even tune in and listen to a webinar or why read the evolutionary um, research of the human foot. Um, one, I think it gives you an appreciation to how the foot was designed to move. A lot of people, um, when they talk about barefoot science and barefoot movement, they they often like to reference that these are primal movements, um, or it's primitive to be barefoot. It's it's primal to do, you know, be on the floor and crawling and rolling. And and a lot of that is true. However, what I think is quite fascinating is even though that that's where our our genetics and uh, movements started where we are today is very different and really our goal the biggest goal that differs from the primitive animal the ape the gorilla etc to the homo sapien is bipedal locomotion and that's really where my passion is with foot function and functional foot training and integrated foot training is that we really need to be training our clients and our patients for bipedal locomotion, which means that we are, are training them for upright stance as well as the repetitive loading and unloading of impact forces and energy. And how can you control the foot to really take in and transfer those forces in a very repetitive manner? So we're going to look at a lot of those differences of um, the primitive foot and how that's shaped into this bipedal foot that we all know and appreciate uh, and respect every single day. So a few fascinating facts as we get started is... The primitive foot and the human foot have all the same bones. And I actually thought that that was quite interesting. When you look at sesamoid bones, so sesamoids are small bones, which are, um, they typically lie within tendons and tendons are muscle bellies. And they start as fibrocartilage uh, 
um, structures which respond to tension and forces and pressure in the uh, shaping of the foot or of the uh, lower extremity. And a lot of the sesamoids that you see in today's human foot, you can actually see dating way back to the primitive foot, which is actually quite fascinating, including the hallucocesmoids, which are underneath the first metatarsal head. Those are still present in the primitive foot. When we look at the flexion lines, the flexion line the flexion lines of the primitive foot actually match that of the human foot and specifically those seen in the newborn, which, um, again, that's, that's more of like a fascinating supporter of the evolution of the human foot. Huge thing that we're going to go into is the structure that really differentiates the primitive foot from the human foot is the arches, the transverse arch, the medial arch, and the lateral arch. Those arches were developed and shaped for and by ambulation. And we're gonna go into those different arches and how uh, they really were shaped comparing the human foot specifically to the chimpanzee foot. Only muscle in the primitive foot that is not in all human feet is the plantaris muscle. And we'll actually see that the plantaris muscle actually is very closely related to the, to the plantar fascia that we all now really respect as far as energy transfer. Uh, this next fact is kind of like a trivial pursuit question. Is the only muscle in the human foot that is not in the primitive foot is the pronius tertius. This is a muscle that is on the dorsal aspect of the foot. And we'll look at that a little bit closer. Why, um, from an evolution perspective, that muscle uh, actually took form. The interossei, if you're not familiar with the interossei, we're going to go into those as well. Uh, the primary purpose of the interossei in the human foot is to stabilize the lever for push-off. And we're going to see, of course, how that started to shape. And then the flexor hallucis brevis in the human foot has a second belly, which is specific to this fascial crossing and fascial integration that I often go into in the barefoot training specialist certification. And we'll, we'll be reviewing that. So when we look at the osseous structures between the primitive foot, which is here on the left, and the human foot on the right, we can see that they have the exact same talus, calcaneus, the cuneiforms, the naviculae, cuboid, the metatarsals. The biggest difference we see with the metatarsals is that the primitive foot or the primate foot, the hallux and the great toe is more for grasping. And because they are not uh, bipedal, that grasping of tree branches and for climbing and almost like two additional hands, which are the feet, is why this structure, the first metatarsal and the, the two fa phalanx, phalanges, are in this orientation. So again, all the exact same, including sesamoid bones. So this osseous similarity, this grasping first metatarsal into the great toe, we're going to see has evolved into the first ray. So again, as I had mentioned, as far as the sesamoid, even in the primitive foot, you see sesamoids. And when we look at the sesamoids, some of the sesamoids that were actually more prevalent in primates and the, pre the primitive foot and the evolution into the human foot that we know today are two sesamoids in, in particular. The fabella, which is found in the lateral belly of the gastrocnemius, that actually has a higher prevalence in the primitive or the primates. The other sesamoid that has a higher prevalence in uh, primates is the osperineum. Now, the osperineum, which is the picture on the left here, you actually do see that every once in a while in patients. Not as high as, again, historically from this evolution of the human foot. Why you don't see it as much is because the tendon that the osperineum lies in is the peroneus longus. We're going to see when we start looking at the first ray and the grasping mechanism of the primitive foot is the osperineum actually played a very large role in the adduction of the great, of the great toe towards the midline. And that's really what from a, a tension perspective, formed this os perineum. 
because we're not using the first ray and the great toe for grasping, it's more of a propulsive that changes the tension that lies on the peroneus longus tendon and therefore decreases the incidence of an os perineum. Again, does that change your programming? Not necessarily, but I think it's a pretty cool factoid as far as how the os perineum is formed and how there's actually becoming less and less of a prevalence of this sesamoid in the human foot. So again, we had mentioned with the flexion line. So this is on the left side. That would be a primate foot. And you can see that the hallux is much more designed for grasping. That's what the most important thing with the foot is, is grasping, climbing, climbing trees, grasping their food, etc. Whereas in the human foot, obviously our goal is propulsion. Flexion lines stay the same. What forms those flexion lines is the grasping and that adduction of the great toe. That adduction of the great toe and that first metatarsal, what that eventually forms in the human foot is what's called the first ray. Now, if you have not taken any of the BTS certifications or have not um, kind of followed some of the blogs that I write and the articles, etc., where I speak a lot about the first ray. If you're not familiar with the first ray, what the first ray is, is it's formed by if you can see my arrow, this is the medial cuneiform. It is in line with the first metatarsal. So really that met cuneiform junction all the way extending to the great to the great toe, that's considered your first ray. Now, if we look at the picture on the right, so this would be a posterior to anterior perspective, is you can see that the first ray here in this picture is actually dropping down. Now, the movements of your first ray are dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. If you're listening and sitting in a way that you could actually grab your foot, slide off your shoes and grab your foot, and you've never moved your first ray, the way that you can actually feel how your first ray moves is if you take, let's say your right foot, and I'm gonna have you take your right hand, and you're gonna grab metatarsals two, three, four, five with your right hand, and you're gonna hold them in place. You're gonna take your left hand and you're gonna grab your first metatarsal, Keeping your right hand exactly where it is, I want you to take your left hand and move the medial side of your foot up and down. You can actually see how that first ray is moving, dorsal and plantar. That's the movements of your first ray. Essentially, you are moving on the axis of the medial cuneiform, that first metatarsal up and down. Now, when you look at the shaping of the human foot and the fact that in the primitive foot, if we go all the way back to here, in the primitive foot, the first metatarsal was angled out towards the side. Really, that helps you understand and appreciate how the first ray in the human foot actually has its own axis. So that's that's the biggest takeaway here, is that first ray human foot does dorsal plantar, but it actually lies within its own axis. And metatarsals two, three, four, five they don't have that same axis. So kind of the appropriate terminology of first ray, that exists only within that. So there's not like a second, third, fourth, fifth ray. There's only a first ray. And it does dorsal and plantar flexion. That dorsal and plantar flexion ultimately is going to influence how we get over our great toe. Because again, remember, the goal of the human foot is bipedal locomotion. So getting over that great toe is critical. We use the first ray to get over our first MPJ. To get optimal first MPJ dorsiflexion, your first ray must plantar flex. Your first ray must plantar flex. So if we look over here real quick and we look at this bottom picture here, the muscles that actually control your first ray, and we'll go into this again, but the muscles that control your first ray coming down off of the top, if you're following my arrow, and inserting here onto the dorsal aspect of the cuneiform and first metatarsal is your tibialis anterior. Coming across the bottom of the foot, over here, wrapping, you can see it's coming from lateral to medial and inserting on the bottom aspect of the first metatarsal and medial cuneiform is going to be your peroneus longus. So when we look at the plantar flexion of the first ray that we need, that is really driven through your peroneus longus. So optimal first MPJ dorsiflexion lies within activation of your peroneus longus and plantar flexion of your first ray 
first ray biomechanics huge and you, you could almost see that the what really made the primitive foot stand out functionally was the grasping hallux, the grasping aspect of that first metatarsal and hallux. What really differentiates the human foot for uh, propulsion and locomotion is the stabilization of that first ray and the plantar flexion to get over the great toe. So a lot of that functionality still lies within that medial aspect of the great of the of the foot. So um, this picture gives another kind of um, uh, anatomy representation of how the pronus longus is going to wrap underneath here. Tibialis anterior is on top here. We said the, that the pronus longus, its primary function in the primitive foot used to be a deduction of the great toe. So it was a very powerful a deductor. Now in the human foot, it's shifted to be a plantar flexor of the first ray. And what that really does is that stabilizes the foot to become what is called a rigid lever. The primitive foot does not have the capability to become what's called a rigid lever. When we look at bipedal locomotion and the loading and unloading of impact forces, really your ability to release energy and release power, like power at propulsion, vertical jump, acceleration, is dictated by your ability to create a rigid lever. So when I speak from an athletic perspective is the faster that an athlete can lock their foot and create this rigid lever, the faster they will be, the more agile they will be. So a lot of that is dictated by that human, that unique human foot function, which is to become a rigid lever. Now the interossei, interossei play a very important role in how we stabilize our foot to become a rigid lever. Coming off of, or the, the interossei come off of the tendon of the peroneus longus. So if we go back over here real quick, um, looking here, and I'm sorry, I have to go back another one. I apologize. So here, when we look at the human's foot, human foot's ability to become a rigid lever, it's really dictated by these muscles right here. These guys are the big players when it comes to becoming a rigid lever. Your posterior tibialis, which is your deep front fascial line, is the most powerful supinator of the foot. The most powerful supinator of the foot is going to play a huge role in how quick you can lock your foot and become this rigid lever from a rear foot perspective. Your posterior tibialis actually has myofascial attachment to your peroneus longus. So you have posterior tibialis critical to locking the foot, myofascially connecting to the peroneus longus, which most important function is to plantar flex the first ray and get you stable to get over your big toe. Originating on the tendon of the pronius longus are these guys, are your interossei. Now, from a evolution perspective, what differentiates the primitive foot from the human foot as it relates to, to the interossei is that as the human foot and bipedal locomotion started to kind of progress and shape the foot, the interossei actually shifted to take a more intermetatarsal orientation which means that their line of pull is directly sagittal. And the primary function of your interossei is to stabilize your lesser MPJs for push off. And it's quite fascinating to see how, uh, you know, evolution function just knew that these interossei, their function was to stabilize the lesser MPJs. And if locomotion is in the sagittal plane and you need that liver that lever to be stable in that sagittal plane they are going to shift their angle of pull to be directly perpendicular to those mpjs and that lever quite fascinating so interossei huge 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 in the evolution of the human foot now, as we start looking at weight bearing, this is the other part that really differentiates the human foot from the primitive foot, it has to do with our weight bearing. Now, if we look at this picture, and I, I have the article referenced of where I got these pictures, just in case if you wanna um, read the article as well. So this is comparing the human foot to a chimpanzee foot. And the, the top picture, is the chimpanzee foot when it is in what's called a semi-plantigrade. 
which means normally when a chimpanzee is standing, it's never all the way flat on the ground. So it's never assuming this position. It's almost like, you know how a horse is kind of, um, the term equinus mean, means, you know, you're sitting a little bit more on the front of the foot. That comes from uh horses being, you know, a little bit more on the front of the foot, kind of think that exact same thing. So the normal position, let's say the neutral position for the chimpanzee foot is to be kind of in that forward position, which means that when they're in that forward position, and if you look at it, you can see that most of their body weight, if you were kind of on the, the front of your foot, most of your body weight is being, um, stressed or you're bearing your weight on the navicular and on the cuboid. So you're on those midfoot bones. Now, as soon as the chimpanzee goes flat and, and tries to stand like the human stands, this is what happens to their foot. It completely drops down and they get what's called a mid tarsal break or a collapse. And we're going to look at the human flat foot and how that actually compares to that bottom picture. Now, when we look at the human foot, which is the center picture, that's actually what's considered plantigrade. So a human foot is plantigrade, where a more primitive primate chimpanzee foot would be semi-plantigrade. In the human foot, we are bearing our weight. And what's shifted from an evolution perspective is that we bear our weight on the metatarsals, and the calcaneus. And it was really that shift to allow us to bear our body weight on the calcaneus and the metatarsals that allowed us to become bipedal. And so uh, when, when you start reading the evolution research, it, it starts to question, well, did the bipedal movement create the arch or was it the formation of the arches that allowed bipedal locomotion? probably a combination of both, but definitely we need these arches for optimal human bipedal locomotion. And that's going to relate to how we start looking at the flat foot. <laughs> Murphy, I'm so sorry. So when we look at the when we look at the human foot here, the biggest things that stand out, and if you've never heard these terms, then I want you to get familiar with these terms as it relates to the human foot. First term has to do with calcaneal inclination. It really was the inclination of the calcaneus that started to shape the human foot and to really allow bipedal locomotion. As soon as the calcaneus inclination started to increase, the met declination started to increase as well. These two these two com components of the human foot, the inclination and the declination, is really what shapes the arches or the foot that we classically associate with your human foot. So, calcaneal inclination, you're going to look at a flat foot and see how they do not have that calcaneal inclination, and the met declination. If you read x rays and, and you um, assess x rays, these are actually some to um, radiographic findings that I assess in all of my patients. You want to, want to know what these angles are. When you have somebody who has a very high arched cavus foot, they actually have a sharper calcaneal inclination and a more um, exaggerated met declination. When you have a anterior cavus foot, if you've ever, if you've taken one of my workshops, I kind of throw that out there a little bit. There's a foot that's called an anterior cavus foot. They have an even more exaggerated met declination. So again, two radiographic findings that I would highly recommend starting to look at if you do look at uh, foot x-rays. So again, the shaping of the arch is huge for ambulation. If you were to choose one of these arches that you think played the more important role in bipedal locomotion, which one would you choose? My guess is that a lot of people would probably choose the medial arch because that's the one that's really emphasized so much. What's interesting is that it was actually the formation of the transverse arch which allowed bipedal locomotion.
Now, when we look at the, the transverse arch, this is, um, again, comparing to the chimpanzee. This one here, the picture on the, the two on the bottom is going to be the, um, the chimpanzee, where the one on the top, so A, this is the human foot. So if you're looking at the foot from an anterior to posterior perspective, the one that is shadowed here, that's the basis of your metatarsals. So these would be the head of the metatarsals and the basis. So you can tell that there's a declination, right? This is actually a 15, de 15 degree declination. When we are here in C, this would be the chimpanzee foot when it is in this top picture here. That's the chimpanzee foot when it's semi-plantigrade. However, as soon as that primitive foot goes full weight bearing, which is how a human stands, what happens here on the bottom C actually looks like this. And you, you can't be bipedal or optimally bipedal if that's what your transverse arch is and how it relates to the bases of the metatarsals. So really that, that met declination and the formation of the transverse arch is what allowed for ambulation. Other thing that you will notice if you kind of step back and take a look here is do you see how it looks like all of the body weight is on fifth metatarsal and first metatarsal? We actually have uh, certain foot types that are really like almost like tripod foot type. Right, And you can actually see how that's going to affect or how transverse arch is going to affect the way that we distribute pressure, maybe callus distribution in a patient as well or in a client. So part of the evolution of the transverse arch was not just that declination, but also this flattening of the uh, metatarsal heads. They actually uh, created a torsion that rotated inward. And that inward torsion allowed a more even body weight distribution across the lever. So now what this transverse arch is forming is the lever that we know must be stable in order to release energy. If we look back here, another key, key component is that when we look at the primitive foot or the primate foot here is they bear most of their weight on the navicular and the cuboid which means that their mid-tarsal joints, so the talonavicular joint and the calcaneocuboid joint, are freely movable, which allows for grasping. What that allows is for the primate to actually stand. And if you've ever seen a orangutan, they actually walk on the outside of their foot. What allows them to walk on the outside of their foot is the fact that their mid-tarsal is completely unlocked, just like this bottom picture here, and it allows that rotation to be out on the outside of the foot. What that looks like, it was very hard for me to try to find a picture, but what that looks like is very similar to here in this picture on the bottom, how that foot is rotating all the way into that extreme inverted position. It enhances grasping, which is why, again, primary function of the primate foot is grasping. So if you're going to get enhanced grasping by fully inverting through your metarsal joint, it makes sense that you're going to want that to be unlocked. When we look at the human foot, our mid-tarsal joints have actually very little mobility. So your calcaneal cuboid joint has so little mobility. Talonavicular joint, you do have some patients or clients who have excessive. However, if you have excessive mobility in your mid-tarsal joint, you start looking like this bottom picture, right? You're going to have that navicular drop. You're going to have that overpronation. You're going to start getting all of these symptoms that are associated with that unstable foot. However, optimal function of the human foot is supposed to have very little motion in the mid-tarsal joint because, again, our goal is ambulation. So how does a flat foot compare to a primitive foot? This would be a flat foot. This is a severe flat foot. This this foot has the talonavicular subluxation, the navicular drop. They're completely pronated into their rear foot. You can actually see down here, along here. This is all the navicular. This is the tailor head that's coming down. This is the navicular here. So they have a total 
uh, midfoot collapse is what I would pretty much sum this up. So radiographically, what this foot looks like is this. And if you've ever, or if you've never seen a x-ray of a severe flat foot, this is what they look like. And they often have this mid tarsal break, which is characteristic of a primitive foot or a primate foot. We see here, remember the two, the two um, angles that we're supposed to look for on an x-ray. First one is calcaneal inclination. Do you see how this calcaneus is completely parallel to the ground? Now, this is something that's important. When I get people who say, um, okay, well, how do I know which flat feet are going to respond to barefoot training? How do I know, you know, which ones really should be in orthotics? Which, how do I know which ones are not going to tolerate orthotics? And you just kind of have to, you know, deal with the foot. You know, there, there's many different types of flat feet. I often say that there is a flexible flat foot. There's a rigid flat foot. There's kind of like a, a pancake foot. A pancake foot, which is one that has no arch, completely flat, their x-ray looks very similar to this one that we have up on the screen right now. And I try to get professionals and movement specialists to understand that if you have a, a foot that's kind of like a pancake foot, mid-tarsal break, it's, it's really kind of lying within its primitive roots, which means that it's going to move in... Um, it's never going to move in the way that other human feet move, human feet that have the characteristic calcaneal inclination and metatarsal declination, because those two angles are critical to optimal foot function. If you have here, and this is actually <laughs> quite funny, they have um, this foot that is, you could say that this is a human foot that still has like a strong genetic um a genetic feed for more of these, these prim primitive characteristics with the mid-tarsal break, the unlocking of the midfoot here, calcaneal inclination is almost non-existent, met declination almost non-existent, and they have an os perineum, <laughs> which again, when you're seeing that and understand that an os perineum is much more of like primitive uh, sesamoid, it's kind of, kind of interesting. It's, entertain myself by seeing that. Um, so again, here, this is very, very important. This foot does not tolerate orthotics well, because you're trying to move osseous structures that are just, you can't create cocaineal inclination in a foot like this with, without surgery. It, it's, it's just not, the, the structures do not move that way. And understanding that I think is very important. So the way from a functional perspective that a foot like this or this is going to move is that they're actually going to flex at that mid-tarsal joint. Now, I often say in my workshops that the mid-tarsal joint is almost like the second ankle. So when we push off here, we really are trying to get that push off happening at your ankle joint. Your ankle axis is where you want to have that push off happening. In the primitive foot, which is where they're, they have that mid-tarsal break, or in the um, extreme flat foot, like we saw the x-ray in that example, they're going to flex at the second ankle, or at, let's say, we'll, we'll even call it the, the primitive ankle, which is that mid-tarsal joint. And you can see that, that complete difference. This, this picture on the left is not going to be able to release optimal energy or power at push off because they're not becoming the rigid lever that we need. So very, very fascinating to start kind of looking at that. So um, because we're talking about medial column, we have to talk about bunions because those are directly related to the medial column. Here we see a bunion. Again, uh, bunions are characteristically seen in, in overpronated, unlocked, hypermobile, flexible feet where from a x-ray perspective, this is what a bunion looks like. And even though we think about the bunion as happening at the great toe joint or the first MP joint, it's actually much more of a midfoot first ray dysfunction than a distal first MPJ dysfunction. So looking at an x-ray, we see here what creates a bunion and what a bunion is, is it is a instability or kind of like a break instability at the met cuneiform joint 
When that joint is unstable, it is allowed to swing out almost in this primitive way. Because the musculature is kind of, it's changed its angulation slightly, you have the adductor hallucis here, which is going to pull the hallux towards the midline of the foot. And that formation is what a bunion is. If we were to look at the primitive foot here and how this first ray or the first metatarsal swings out, because the musculature in the primitive foot is not shifted like in the human foot, the hallux stays right in line with that first metatarsal. So it's almost like in a foot that has a bunion, kind of like genetic bunions, which is um, kind of lied within the stability of your first ray, you could say, um, where some people, when you see bunions in teenagers, so like a juvenile bunion, that would then genetically, so that could be one that you could kind of argue genetics a little bit, even though I Try not to throw that around there too much, but structurally, their foot has much less first metatarsal cuneiform first ray stability from a evolution perspective. So you know that it has to do with the way that their foot was made up from a genetic perspective and how much stability evolutionarily they had in that first ray. So then I would argue that. Um, bunions are also moving towards that primitive foot. So you're almost going back to the primitive foot when you have a bunion, particularly a bunion that is related to either juvenile, hypermobile first ray, overpronation, instability of the medial column. Moving forward, since we're almost, almost done, is a um, key thing that differentiates the human foot from the primitive foot is the evolution of the pronius tertius. This picture is kind of denoting where that pronius tertius is. It's a dorsal muscle. It is seen as a dorsiflexor and a everter, where if we look at it from, from here, it's coming off and it's, it is an extension of the extensor digitorum longus on the dorsal aspect of the foot. So um, the size and um, strength and variability of this muscle is actually quite large, again, based on just, you know, evolution and genetics of how things were passed through. I've seen some patients that don't even have this muscle, so it's not prevalent in every patient as well. This, the primary function of the pronius tertius is to resist this action of the primate foot and to pull your foot into that much inversion from a grasping perspective you could see how on the dorsal aspect you need, would need a muscle which is going to evert and keep that foot in that uh, plantigrade position that we associate with the human foot last section here last uh, cool little fact is the evolution of energy transfer again this is deeply rooted in our ability to create a rigid lever and how that relates, again, from an uh, evolution perspective, has to do with the plantaris muscle. Now, this is a muscle that I don't speak too often in my courses. Um, it is often associated with what's called the triceps surrey. So triceps surrey is plantaris, gastrocnemius, and soleus together, inserting down in the Achilles tendon towards its insertion in the calcaneus. In a lot of people, they don't even have the plantaris muscle. Plantaris muscle would fall under what is called a vestigial muscle, where um, from an evolution perspective, anatomists are saying it has um, less and less to no function at all. And eventually, it's just not going to exist in the human body anymore. When you, when you look at this, which is kind of the bottom part that we speak about, is even though it's shifting its muscular role, it's actually becoming a very important sensory uh, muscle or sensory tissue within the function of the um, human foot. So plantaris muscle, interestingly, is less than 3% the mass of the gastrocnemius. So this is clearly not a strong muscle <laughs> when you're thinking about the gastrocnemius. And when you compare the soleus with the gastrocnemius, the soleus is actually stronger than the gastrocnemius. So um, it's very uh, negligible in its function from a motor perspective.
So its original insertion was on the bottom of the foot. And then there is um, what was called a uh, extension of the calcaneus, so a posterior elongation of the calcaneus. And if you can almost visualize or take your hand, and if you if you take your hand and visualize how the plantar muscle is going to come down and insert along, let's say the where the uh, metatarsal heads are in your hand, right? So if you're kind of mimicking that your hand is like a semi plantigrade foot. Plantaris comes down, wraps down, it's going to insert where that's, that's kind of like your, the posterior aspect of your foot would be those metatarsal heads. When you become plantigrade and you drop your, the heel down and then your calcaneal elongates posterior, you're essentially driving the calcaneus through the tendon of the plantaris. So your plantar fascia is actually myofascially and evolutionarily highly associated to the plantar's muscle. Evolutionists and evolution anatomists actually associate the plantar fascia directly with the plant the plantaris muscle and, and say that that's almost the plantaris tendon that is now underneath the bottom of the foot. So when we look at the plantar fascia and fascia in general, we know that fascia is a highly proprioceptive rich tissue, which leads us into now the function of the plantaris, which is primary sensory. So you have five times as many proprioceptors in your plantaris versus triceps surrey. So triceps surrey as a group, you have five times as many proprioceptors in the plantaris. You also have nine times the density of muscle spindles in the plantaris versus the gastrocnemius, which is quite fascinating. So it's showing that from an evolution perspective, and because it's so deeply linked to your plantar fascia and fascia in general, we know that it's now a sensory muscle, not a motor muscle. So if you look at it from a classic biomechanic perspective, I could see how you could see this as a vestigial muscle. However, I'm sure everybody who's listening to this appreciates that fascial sensory proprioceptive role that really controls human movement um, in a more efficient way than classic biomechanics. So calcaneal elongation, this is the last thing that we're going into. Top row here, that's the chimpanzee foot or bones. And then all of this is a calcaneus. It's just different angles. And then the bottom images are the human calcaneus. And you can see from uh, the changing shape and characteristics of it is that it didn't change too much, right? So it's actually quite fascinating how similar the human calcaneus is to the chimpanzee calcaneus. But there's definitely a elongation that happened because that calcaneus has to bear our body weight during bipedal locomotion. And again, it was that elongation of the calcaneus that formed the plantar fascia, which is why if you've heard, you know, Achilles tendon, the whole posterior chain, Achilles tendon runs underneath the bottom of the foot and becomes part of the, the plantar fascia. It really was that calcaneal elongation that drove it underneath the bottom of the foot. And um, right here, last thing that I'll mention, this anterior lateral um, tubercle here on the calcaneus, that actually blocks the eversion. So there are uh, evolutionary characteristics which actually limit and want to limit eversion within the human foot, knowing that if you go into too much eversion, you're going to assume that primitive uh, mid-tarsal break that we also saw on the flat foot, and then how that ultimately influences how you're going to walk. So how can this knowledge influence your practice? Hopefully it gives you an appreciation. Uh, when I give uh, different lectures, particularly when people are first introducing themselves to foot, foot anatomy, foot function, is I think um, the first step is really appreciating the complexity of the human foot, um, appreciating, you know, its evolution and um, kind of the, the fascinating formation of different structures and how certain uh, compensation patterns into the foot actually bring us back to this um, kind of primate foot 
that I could actually now see a person arguing and saying like, if you want to be primal, you actually don't want to be primal in your foot <laughs> from a biomechanic perspective. Be barefoot and stimulate and be natural that way. But to truly be primal and primitive with your foot means that you're actually becoming uh, an overpronated navicular draw, medial column instability bunions. So you don't want a primitive foot. <laughs> but um, again, helps you appreciate it. I think anatomy is fascinating. and. Um, seeing how different muscles have shaped over time and you know, especially sesamoids and different things like that. So the next time that you see a flat foot with a mid tarsal break and they have an os perineum, that can start to feed that they are more of a primitive foot. So if you want to read some of the articles that um, are referenced here or that I got some of the images. You can check out these articles, quite fascinating. All of them are available online. Um, actually read quite a few articles from the 1920s and 30s, which is, I always think that that's so fascinating. That's one of the best things about the internet is that you can actually get some of that literature from the 1920s and how they looked at um, certain anatomy and dysfunction. It's also quite fascinating to see how how like spot on they were with some concepts that are not even fully appreciated now, but almost a hundred years ago, they were very kind of intuitive to pick up on certain um, anatomy associations. So there's definitely some some fascinating fascial crossings that are mentioned in these older uh, anatomy. Uh, research articles. So I highly encourage you to check those out. Uh, and then finally, if you want more information on EBFA and our certifications, please check us out on uh, on our website, which is ebfafitness.com. Again, if you want a recording of this, um, please check it out on youtube.com backslash EBFA fitness. If you want the PowerPoint, that is at email at EBFA, sorry, education at ebfafitness.com. I apologize, education at ebfafitness.com. And if there are any questions, you may let me know. Otherwise, I encourage you to kind of explore some of these. If you do not have access to... Um, to x-rays of your of your patients, I would definitely um, try to get them to bring them in because you can learn a lot about the foot and what you're seeing from a clinical perspective and how that actually looks from a radio radiographic perspective. So um, evolution of the Achilles, particularly the spinal attachment to the gastrocnemius. Okay, so um, this is a great question by Andrew. Is, so he's talking about the evolution of the Achilles tendon and how it spirals towards its insertion. What we are going to do is another webinar. When I get back, I'm doing five weeks in Asia. When I get back, we need to do a embryology webinar where evolution would be how primate compares to human foot. We need to do one that has to do with the embryology and how the um, the embryo is shaped and kind of derotated as we as we grow and different tibia antiversion retroversion all of that would be in more of a embryology based webinar which I will definitely do that will be the next one that I do so uh, great great question yes very very fascinating um, all right, so if there are no other question, then um, thank you guys so much for your support, and uh, I always appreciate your, your taking the time to tune in and listen to these webinars. If you ever have any suggestions for webinars, please do not hesitate to email us as well. If you have any suggestions for the video blogs that we do as well, where I do little quick five-minute um, YouTube, Facebook videos on different topics, please uh, let me know.
And okay, so another question real quick. I'll take two more questions and then um, we'll wrap up. So what is the best foot type for orthotics? I would say the best foot type for an orthotic would be a flexible flat foot, which means that when they are open chain, you can see that they have an arch. And then as soon as they stand up, they pronate or they collapse down. So that would be the one that is the easiest controlled with an orthotic. That's also the one that is the easiest controlled with corrective exercise. So short foot, glute strengthening, post-tip strengthening, that flexible flat foot with like mild pronation is the um, easiest to respond. Um, question as far as primates not having plantar fascia, they do have plantar fascia or this plantar aponeurosis is what it's called. That plantar aponeurosis is the extension of the uh, plantaris tendon. So the tendon wrapped down and came underneath the bottom of the foot. So they still do have the plantar fascia. Very good question. Okay, so if there are no other questions, thank you guys so much, and I hope to see you on a future webinar. Have a great night, or if it is morning, have a great day, and stay barefoot strong.